and a, a group of people, kind of led off by uh, Sacramento Self-Help Housing. One of the ladies there was from San Juan uh, Unified, and she was a liaison for homeless children in the district. She, she, she shared with us that there are 2,500 kids in San Juan Unified that are homeless. Doesn't mean they live on the street. They couch surf and go to house to house, but they don't have a home where they can go. Regular meals and parenting and those types of deals. And I mentioned that to Pastor. And I said, Pastor, we got some work to do. <laughs> like we have got enough, like we don't have enough now, you know, but you know, it's out there. That's what God calls us to do. I'm look I'm thinking of one of the a song sang at sang tonight cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. How many weaklings are here? <laughs> here we go. <laughs> But, you know, you're made strong in the Savior's love. You just give it to him. That's the key. I want to do a little experiment tonight to prove one of the principles of the kingdom of God. I want you to turn to the person next to you on the right or left. It doesn't matter whether you know him or not. I want you to give them the biggest smile that you can put on. I mean, give them a really big, joyful, radiant smile. And keep doing it until I tell you to turn it off. Come on. That was pretty cool. That was crazy cool, but you know, based on my observation, most, if not all, of you got an even bigger smile back than the one you laid out there. Or at least some, uh, a smile mixed with some giggles and laughter. And so we just proved the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. See, you sowed smiles and you sowed joy, and you reap smiles and giggles and joyful expressions back. It works. The law of sowing and reaping is called the law for a reason. It's a godly principle and part of a covenant he made, that he made with Adam and all creation. Back in Genesis 8.22, here's what he says. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. We're talking about seed time and harvest. I'll focus on that. While the earth remains... Well, as long as they're still here, seed time and harvest shall not cease. So why do we have such a tough time understanding this principle when it comes to our giving? It's, it's easy to sow a smile because we immediately reap a harvest back. But our giving more like planting a crop of corn or something like that. You know, yes, we reap exactly what we sow, and yes, we reap more than we sow, but sometimes we've got to wait for it. Sometimes it's immediate. And unfortunately, we live in a world uh, of uh, immediate gratification. We want everything right now. So far, the earth has not ceased, right? Still here. Which means that the principle of seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping, remains active. And all mankind is subject to it. That's all of you. And whenever we obey God's laws, it takes discipline, it takes faith. But in the long run, blessings follow. They really do. Don't have enough to plant, you say? Keep this in mind. If what you have is not what you need, it's not your harvest, it's your seed. What does that mean? If what you have in your pocket is not what you need right now, it's not your harvest, that's your seed. And I'm guessing most of you got a buck or two in your pocket that you don't need right now. Let that be your seed. Let's start it that way, huh? Father, we thank you for this ministry. Thank you, Lord, that you just keep bringing to us these projects. 2,500 homeless kids in one school district close to us. I got an idea, Father, we're going to reach out to those kids just because that's what you planted in us, a spirit of giving and loving. But thank you, Lord, for this offering tonight. Thank you for those that have sacrificed and given. We pray that you multiply it, Lord Jesus, so we can touch more in your kingdom. We pray all these things in your holy, precious name, Jesus. Amen. You know something, Pastor been down all week. I believe we ought to probably have somebody to come up here and pray for Pastor before he. Mike? Mike?
Carlo, God while you're up there, let's get her on there, Pastor. He's been sick all week. He's been down and right in this chest. And right now, eyes open, brother, the windows of the soul. Right now, from my spirit, the spirit of God that's in me, to the spirit of God that's in you. Father God, I just speak to that mucus ball. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, I speak it to break up, come out of this man's chest right now. This is a holy temple. This is your temple. It cannot stay there. That, that mucus ball is a curse. And your son became a curse so that this man doesn't have to have that curse in his body. And I just call you the healed of God right now by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the blood of Jesus. Break. Amen. Amen. Break. Break. Deep breath. Deep breath. That's better. Thank you. Howdy, everybody. I ain't going to let no mucus ball stop me. At least not tonight. <laughs> I got one right here in my pocket for Emer. All right. Somebody go. Like what I just did. Take a deep breath. Hey, Matt, it was so nice for you to come tonight. I heard that you got it. You and your bride received a gift from heaven little daughter congratulations and grandma and grandpa over here too huh <laughs> grandkids are great <laughs> anyway. yeah I can't <laughs> oh. <laughs> that thing that Patrick was just talking about oh uh, I, I grabbed this from Mike uh, I really like that, Rhonda. Thank you. It's just you know, kind of like after the Lucy thing, but it's real simple. That's a good way to get out messages, just real simple. I like simple messages. Sometimes we complicate things. I love Jesus, and you know what? He loves me. You all know that? He loves you. Um, now, I don't know about that dress that's been floating around, but I know that's white and red right there. <laughs> and, and if some of you didn't know what I was talking about, bless you. You haven't been on TV or the Internet. so. <laughs> anyway, but besides that, that dress was black and blue anyway. All right, see? See there? We'll stir it up. I saw black and blue. My granddaughter told me I was nuts, too. But yeah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> God bless you, Steph. Stephanie, say thank you, Jesus. Oh. I love him. I just love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love them, I love them, I love them, I love them. I love them. I need them, I need them, I need them, I love them. Well, okay. You guys are in for a treat tonight because my mind is not here. <laughs> so I'm going to start off random with a random punch and uh, thinking about, well, you started this, Tammy, about, yes, the presence of God is... He's everywhere. And we need to recognize that. I mean, if you ever walk outside at night after you become a believer and you look up at the stars, you look up at the sun in the daytime. Well, don't stare at it, but you look at the magnificence of his creation. The heavens and the earth declare his glory. Oh, man, you are without excuse. I mean... He fills the heavens and the earth. And his handiwork is everywhere. Then we look at that little daughter. I know I got a few daughters. And when my first daughter was born, I wept. I thought I, I thought I was a believer until I saw that. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> what a miracle. And 
you know, things that happen to us in our lifetime. I don't see how an old person can be a non-believer unless they're just bitter and stubborn. I guess there's a lot of that going around. Speaking to bitterness and stubbornness, people need to let go of stuff. I mean, you know, life is hard at times, but we've got to keep going. We just don't give up. We don't ever throw in the towel, and we keep moving. Because better days are ahead, always better days are ahead. And I mean, there's things that happen in our lives, and we suffer loss and everything else. And it's, and it's just, you just don't get over some things, but you've got to keep going. Some things stay with you for a lifetime. There's things that's happened in my life and I remember details. Good and bad things. But when those things happen, you just remember every single thing. And some things you don't even want to remember. And those are the things that you just got to hand to the Lord. But I'll tell you what, the offenses that happen to you, you got to let those go. I mean, that is a message that is in Scripture that's over and over again. And... Even when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he says, you've got to forgive. You want God to forgive you? You've got to forgive. And so we've got to forgive and release people. And the thing is, most people that you're going to have to forgive don't deserve it. Just the way it is. Especially when you've been the brunt in of, and been victimized and tortured or whatever has happened. But the thing is, to forgive is not to say it was okay. It's not to say their, that work is finished in them. It's to say, I'm done with it and I'm releasing them. I mean, when Stephen was sitting there being stoned to death, do you think Saul of Tarsus and all of those religious people deserve to be released and that that should be taken from them? But he did it anyway. And he looks up into the heavens and the heavens open and he sees the Father and the Son and he, and he says, don't hold this to their charge. He does the divine thing and releases Saul so that within the next few days, Saul becomes Paul, the apostle, because he has a headlong encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, when you run headlong into Jesus, something's got to give. Something's going to change. I don't care what kind of terrorist you are. Speaking about it, we need some preachers to have headlong encounters with Jesus. What? Am I... I'm just feeling ornery. Well, I think that terrorist preachers need to just stop. They need, a, they need to preach the gospel. Amen. Huh? Okay. Hey, I know. I learned the hard way. I had an old man come up to me and say, I mean, this is back when I preached my first few sermons. This is a long time ago. You know, I preached my first sermon when I was like 12 years old. But, uh, he comes up and he says, say something. You know you can catch a lot more hunt of bees with honey than you can vinegar. <laughs> oh, I get it. And you can. So, gracious words should come out of our mouth. That doesn't mean quit swearing, although maybe some of you should. But that means when you speak, impart grace to the hearer. Huh? I wasn't, you just pointed out yourself. I didn't have nothing to do with that. Oh, you did. Well, you got to give Stephanie a pass right now. She's just not herself tonight. So. <laughs> she can do anything she wants. I We can help her be strong. We can be strong for her. We, he can be strong in her. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a good word. Did I finish what I was talking about? I did that to myself. Bees and honey. So when we are speaking, 
the words that's coming out should be grace and peace and life. And as a matter of fact, don't give the time of day to those nasty words that come out. Some of you all need to turn that off. I don't care whether it's a radio or a television or a, a voice speaking in your ear. Just turn that sucker off. You know, some of you got that, 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 that offense thing. But you'd let that go. You forgave them. Why is that offense record still running in your head? What's up with the head? Huh? See, people are giving people up tonight. You better put that thing away, brother. <laughs> Not that I disagree with you. I'm just telling you. Watch out. <laughs> and besides, you're talking about a woman. I mean, you know, that is what it is. When you say, Sue, shut up, that's your own Sue K, all right? Not somebody else's. Men get it wrong all the time. I mean, men go around telling their women, woman, and these are supposed to be godly men too. They say, you're supposed to submit to me. Whoa, 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 whoa. The scripture never told the man to tell the woman to submit. How many of you men, some of you older men have tried that and you find out that's not the good thing to do? Especially at a certain times, you just don't say stupid stuff. Submit woman, really? See, I found out a long time ago, I'm the king of my castle, but she's the boss. Anyway, it said husbands, in this same portion of scripture where it says, it didn't tell her to love her husband, it says submit to him. But that was speaking to her. It says, why? But it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Men, you want your women to submit to you? Why don't you lay down for her then? Why don't you show her? Just don't tell her. Some of you need to say it too. Sometimes you got to get your little motor going to get your doer going. I don't care what you say. I'm concerned about what you do. So quit cussing. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm feeling better all over more than anywhere else. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't miss a preaching engagement if I had to. I mean, we got capable people. I could have easily said, I'm just going to, you know take the night off and I got capable ministers all in the house here that would do an awesome job. I wouldn't even have to trip and watch them on live stream. I'd know they'd be doing good. But I just wanted to come and hang out with you all tonight. So I'm gonna be... And we got a special guest for you coming next Friday too. I mean a special guest. You do not want to miss it. Because he'll come and nix everything that's nasty. <laughs> and pray for me because I'm going to have to do what back to back almost four different sermons uh, and services down there so so we're going to have fun uh, if they don't have kingdom already they're going to have some uh, anyway so how y'all doing now isn't the presence of God sweet there is certain flows of the spirit and it might extremely change at times, you know, even in the course of one service. But the thing is, you've got to find that groove. And it, doesn't, it isn't so much about how long you've been doing something or how much spiritual knowledge you have. It's about knowing Him and hanging out with Him and understanding what the anointing is and to get in that flow of the Holy Spirit, you see. Because it's not good enough just to speak right things and good things. You want to speak. Speak by the utterance of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times people think utterance is something. Listen, utterance is saying what God is saying. It is Spirit speaking to the Spirit. And if I talk to your head, what's going to change? Not much. But if the Spirit calls to the deep, something's going to change. And that's what the anointing is all about. See, the anointing 
isn't for any single person to make them sound, look good, give them special powers to do things in the supernatural or anything else. But it is given to a person so that he might touch the world or she might touch the world with the presence of God. And the thing is, once you're touched, you should let the change in the process begin in you. Don't be scared of it. Surrender to it. That's one thing you should surrender and submit to. Submit to the presence of God. And you'll never regret it. You'll never go home empty. As a matter of fact, how many of you have been dumped on? You've been lied to. You've been used and abused. You've been violated. Listen, I want to tell you something right now. God will never do that. He will never abuse you. He will never take advantage of you. He will never lie to you. And He will never take you out somewhere and leave you alone on your own to get home. He will never do that. Matter of fact, He prompted, not even to the end of the world, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the thing is, we need to have that spiritual understanding. You see, everybody... No, not everybody. A lot of folks want to take things and just naturalize them. They think that's the way to understand. No, the thing, the way that you understand is to have a spiritual understander, to put on a spiritual thinker, not to naturalize things. To bring them out of the spirit and try to naturalize them is not the answer, but to move into the realm of the spirit to receive the things of the spirit. And it's not just about hearing the voice of God. It's receiving it and let it penetrate you and respond to it. Let's see, the old King James had a word, hearken to the voice of God or hearken. And they hearkened to the Word of God. That means they just didn't hear the will and the Word of God. They just didn't hear the voice of God. But they responded to it and they were obedient. That's that hearken. When you hear and do what he speaks. As a matter of fact, there's a key in that, in the presence of God. And what I was talking about, finding that flow and stuff, sometimes we get in our heads because we've done it a certain way for so long and that way worked. And the Spirit of God says, no, I don't want you to do it like that no more. I want you to do it like this. We better be sensitive to the Spirit of God and the flow of the Spirit and where he's wanting to take us and be able to break our protocol let me say this, our religious protocol and go with what God is doing because he might sh suddenly on a new day show up and want to do a new thing and do a new thing in us. And we need to be ready to receive his presence and his anointing to get in the flow with what God is doing. Not with some what megachurch is doing or with what somebody else is doing or what somebody else is saying, but what God has called us to do and to find our place. And to come to our destiny in Him. Because our destiny is not off somewhere in the great by and by. Listen, if you wake up and understand who you are and where you're at, your destiny is all around you. See, it's part of the journey that you have in Christ Jesus. There's something glorious about it. Some of those that are waiting to get there someday in the great by and by and get there and realize they missed it all on earth. Hey, this is the time. This is the place. And this is the place to bring great, you know, without seeing things, but just going in faith because you know he's faithful and you know he's true and you know he's not going to fail. And just to move in faith, that pleases God. That's why Jesus said that to Thomas. It's better, you know, to believe without seeing. Because remember, he had to show Thomas the scars and to prove who he was and but those who believe without knowing. That gets the attention of heaven. And I want you to know something. There's great faith. Do you know that God has already given everybody in this room a measure of faith? And that measure of faith will bring you to a place that, where you can receive His presence. And, and not just receive his presence to but understand him and understand what's going on and what he's speaking to you and what he's doing in your life and what he's preparing you for and where he's taking you to does that sound too good to be true listen some things that sound too good to be true need to be checked out and one of those is what god thinks about you and how he loves you and what he's already done on your behalf 
The thi- we as believers need to come out of the old mindset of trying to bring Jesus down into our situation or bring him up. Oh, Jesus, if you were just here. But that's not the voice of faith. That who will descend and bring him up or who will ascend and bring him down. But you know that the word of faith is nigh you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Somebody go, wow. That's good stuff right there. That, That word of faith within you, you see, the word of God is spiritual. It's not natural. It's beyond natural. It's spiritual. And when the Word of God speaks and you respond and you open up and the Spirit of God is quickened within you and you begin to receive the message of God, you begin to receive the direction of God, that's an encounter that just... It's hard to describe to folks. I just had an encounter with God. Really, what happened? He just showed up. He started telling me things. He started telling me things about what has happened in my life and then where I'm going and what I'm going to do. Really? What did he sound like? (laughs) You know how people, you're trying to speak of a spiritual thing and they hear you naturally and that disconnect is there and it's crazy. If you read the scripture, you will see it in scripture over and over again. It's not a problem that we just now stumbled upon. It's always been here. And Jesus ran into that all the time. Even people who were hungry for the truth of the kingdom and believing that he was Messiah. Remember the guy that that, that snuck out at night because he was one of the leaders of the Jews? And so he sneaks out and he privately meets with Jesus. His name was Nick. So Nick at night. Yeah. And he said, you know, he said, I, I know that you're special because you just couldn't do, you know, what you do if you're just a normal person. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. Spiritual statement, a spiritual rebirth, receiving Jesus. Actually, the message and the messenger is the same, one and the same. And Nick, thinking naturally, says, how can that be? How can I be How can I re-enter my mother's womb? See, it's all natural. Jesus said, that which is born of water is water, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And water is not a water baptism either, folks. Uh, That's the natural birth because you come forth from the water. Okay? And that which is born of spirit is spirit. And in you receiving Jesus... And you invite Holy Spirit to come into you. There is a spiritual quickening in the core of your being called the innermost man. It is where the presence of God comes. The old tabernacle was representative of that. In the innermost court, the holy of holies, where the very presence of God was. But you now are that Ark of the Covenant. And when He comes in and He abides in the Holy of Holies within the the man or the woman, that presence of God is there. He is at home in His house. He's at home in His house. Do you know that if you have answers... Or if you have questions and you need answers, you don't have to run and chase and go here or go over there. You don't even have to chase me down because I might not have the right answer for you. But I know God does. I know His Holy Spirit does. As a matter of fact, we're told in Scripture that He will teach you in all things. That He will make known to you the mysteries. As a matter of fact, Jesus Himself said of Holy Spirit, He will show you all things concerning me. Not me, him. That's Holy Spirit. And he's at home in your house. So if you have any question, ask your husband who is at home in your house and tell this to shut up. And that's divine right order. Now that makes a lot of sense. And I know that I still have questions. But you know what? God has answered a good many of them. 
Sometimes he did it before I could get the thought. Before it was formed in my head, he would begin to answer me. Some things I'm still waiting for. Maybe he just doesn't know what I'd do with it. Or maybe he does know what I would do with it. There was a couple things I asked for, which was out there, and in time he revealed them to me, and then he said, now what are you going to do with that? Well, I tried to do a couple things a couple times and made a mess out of it, Mike. Scared people to death. They thought I went off the deep end. I thought I was doing them a service. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus told his disciples before he left the planet, he goes, there are many things I would like to tell you, but you're just not ready. Oh, how long? But then again, they were worth waiting for, just like you are. Listen, none of us has arrived. None of us is even close. Can I say that without offending anybody? Listen, I know what the scripture says, and I know the things that Jesus did. And we basically now in faith are spectators of all the things that he done. And we see miracles happen in the body of Christ. We still see the hand of God move and we see power. But we sometimes are consumed with the idea, and here's another one of those that everybody says, Jesus was fully God and Jesus was fully man. Huh? But if he as God raised the dead and healed the sick and, and all the miraculous things that he did, I mean, that's fantastic and that's still amazing. But what if he was trying to get a point to us? That he was just as dependent upon the presence of God and the Holy Spirit as being all man as any one of us. And he, because he set the example and he put a pretty high standard. But he said to his church, these things you shall do and greater things. What if he was trying to set us up for something greater and we're still trying to struggle with, yeah, but that was Jesus. Well, why when he went through things, he still struggled with things? He felt just like us. The scripture says that he was not the high priest that is apart from us, but he was made just like us in every way. And the key to it is that that life now is in us. You know that Jesus said, they were saying to him, the disciples, show us the Father. I'm not going to get to any scripture tonight. I mean, I'm giving scripture, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, and he said, you still don't know who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see... He was the very image of the Father. Because Jesus, in his natural habitation, didn't represent the flesh of the man Jesus. But he represented the Father in everything that he did. Everything that he said. He didn't declare his own will. He, didn't, he wasn't out to build a kingdom in the name of Jesus at that time. As a matter of fact, when he would get too many followers, remember he's walking and there's like the 12 plus, altogether there was 70, and he like looks back and he goes, if you can't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. He was downsizing all the time, what we would call corporate downsize. Why did he do that? He would like at times try to dry, because it wasn't in that, he was trying to build the kingdom like we would think because his kingdom is in the hearts. It wasn't in a building a mega ministry. I mean, when he told his disciples that he was going to die, and remember what Peter did, and it's in the same setting of Scripture that I was sharing with what I ended with last week when I was talking to you about how he gave us the keys to the kingdom. And Peter was sitting there telling him that you are the Christ, the Messiah. The son of the living God. And he said, Peter, you're a stone. But upon that revelation, upon that revelation of truth, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And then he goes on to tell them what he's going to do and how it's going to happen. And he says, and they're going to take me and abuse me, and then they're going to kill me. Because he's telling them, he's sharing with them as friends, what's going to happen. And Peter says, oh, far be it from you. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And Jesus looked at him and he says, Get behind me, Satan. He just told Peter that he spoke the words of the Father. In the next breath, he's telling Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are not mindful of the things of God, but you are mindful of the things of man. Boy, that should shake us a little bit. How much do we need to lose this old thinker so that we might have the mind of Christ. The scripture says that the mind, the natural mind, is enmity against God. It wars against the things of the Spirit. That's why we must have the mind of Christ. And when we come into that life, there is a victory that's already done on our behalf and given to us, and it's called the life of Jesus Christ. And the same resurrected power that brought Jesus up from the dave, dead will quicken your mortal body, and he will take residence in your house and give you a brand new thinker, a brand new mind, so that you're not plagued with the doubt and the unbelief if we as believers could actually begin to come to that place to understand it is available to every man woman and child on planet earth but we got to receive him we got to believe him and we got to walk in the spirit not chasing the things of the world but the things of god letting them take in preeminence over all things falling in love with him so much that not only Will we give up everything, but we'll chase him anywhere, and we'll go any place he says, and we'll do whatever he tells us, and we'll be marching to a brand new set of orders. The things of the Spirit is where the life is. What does he say about the mind? That thinking, it, the ways is death, but the way of the Spirit is life eternal. Oh, how we need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit. How we need to be imbibed with the very life of God, with the mind of Christ in place instead of trying to figure out how we're going to build this thing and how we're going to do that and how we're going to develop that ministry. What about, what do you want, Jesus? Where do you want us to go and what do you want us to do? I don't care about protocol or anything else. I just want the presence of God in our midst. I want the will of God accomplished in my life. God, give me the grace. Give me the, the, the understanding that I might receive everything that you have created me for. Let your glory be revealed in me and let everything I do be for you. Amen. Okay, when I get back, we're going to have a Holy Ghost service. So... God bless you all. <laughs> Communion tonight, too. Come to the table. You are so good. As the Lord God is good. Through you. <laughs> <laughs>